Hello and welcome. What? Okay. Welcome to another episode of Laptop Retrospective. Today we are going to be looking at another Panasonic Tough Book. This one is the CFH2, and despite the name of book, you will notice that this does not at least come. Uh, factory default with a keyboard or any other input device other than a touch screen with a capacitive uh, pen which is stored up above. Now this one in particular is uh, well it's being a little bit troublesome in terms of getting it to run 100% correct but I thought we would still take a look at it uh, because many of you were interested. Uh, the very first thing we'll do is, of course, is a quick tour of the machine, and then we'll see how far we can take this uh, fellow down. So on the front, we do have, of course, our pen. We do have a fingerprint reader installed in the top right-hand corner. We also, down this side, have a series of buttons, a power button, many indicator lights, and then A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, which... I'm going to be a little critical of, because even if these are shortcut buttons, I don't necessarily see the value in these as much as I have on the previous tablets that actually give you, like, uh, directional buttons and things like that. And then, of course, we have a lock uh, button down here. It is running a Core i5, so it's not the oldest CPU. I will get the specs a little later on, but this is just going to be our quick tour. On the bottom, of course, we do have some kind of dock connector. Not really much to say. This would appear to be some kind of scanner of some kind, I think, because it is a transparent window into what appears to be an eye, but I can't get that working quite yet. On the left-hand side, we have these big bulky things uh, that are covering up our ports, which, don't get me wrong, these seem to be quite robust. Uh, but almost robust to the point of being a little bit on the excessive side. Inside here we have USB 3.0. It's the only USB 3.0 available. And there seems to be a screw-in point here, so it makes me think that an accessory was designed to fit into here, uh, perhaps in a very permanent fashion, and be screwed into place. So that is USB. On this side here we have one of two batteries and we'll go ahead and remove that first one because we will need both out of course to safely disassemble the unit. Along the top we have uh, shortcuts for the barcode scanner that again I'm not 100% sure if it came uh, factory default on every unit and the B1 button. Underneath the handle we have access to uh, serial and network pretty straightforward. On the back we see access to a uh, document camera and a flash, or what would appear to be a flash at the very least. Moving along this side we have our second battery as well as our charging port. Now the battery tab on this one uh, seems to have been damaged so we will need to remove this using uh, less conventional methods. With both of the batteries removed, we can see that they're actually 20 watt hour batteries each. So the idea, of course, is having uh, both of these, you'd have 40 watt hours total. And because there are two battery bays, you can swap one at a time uh, if you needed while you're throwing these other ones on a charger. They are an oversized battery. They're not necessarily camera battery size, but they're definitely closer to that than your standard laptop battery. With both of the batteries removed, we can actually begin our attempt at disassembly. Alright, so first things first. The uh, covers can all be disassembled and removed. However, I'm kind of hoping that that's not necessary to actually get through uh, to the rest of this. We have several easily accessible screw holes all over the handle on the back of the unit and they would all appear to be standard uh, Phillips. The first and easiest component to probably remove is this door here and I anticipate 
then I'm going to find a hard drive under here. And just remove this. Hmm. That's not what I expected. Well, let's try and examine what we've got here, because that's an odd looking little connector. And this is definitely a uh, chassis or a cradle. And by the looks of this, somebody reassembled it in a hurry. All right. So we've got that metal cage off. That plastic cage off. What in the world is in here? Okay. I think I found my way in. So that lifts up and that's our hard drive. Um, all right, so this appears to be a heater. If I had to take a guess keep the hard drive warm and then it's wrapped in foil like a baked potato and has this connector that's not actually really anchored to anything. Okay, let's try and put that back the way that it came from the factory, shall we? Okay, so that's our hard drive back together. Um, yeah, that's, that's a weird out of 10. But they gotta find different ways of executing uh, these designs. That's just not something that you're used to seeing quite like that. So let's continue removing the screws that are probably holding uh, this whole thing together. And see how far inside we can get. These two here look like they also probably need to be removed just because of where they are on the body of the unit. So I knew it was too good to be true. Uh, there are uh, at least one additional screw hidden just in the corner of the uh, top drawers here and here that we're going to need to remove to get this case to let go. I'm also anticipating that these two screws actually have to come loose as well, so we're going to loosen these and see if the rest of the case lets go. So it is this piece that needs to be just yanked right off, actually. That was a little easier than I thought. And now we should be able to take a look inside. Plastic. Foam. Not really anything else to say. Uh, this is gasket sealed, it would appear, all the way along the edges. So this would be uh, a pretty weather, weather safe unit. I don't think I'd try to submerge it. So let's, let's see what we can see. Over here we have our Sierra Wireless Air Prime card. Here, of course, we have uh, a very fat module that's built up of several different chips. Uh, looks like we've got the camera, USB, serial, network, all of that's crammed into here. And it's, like, thick. Uh, we've got our two battery bays, a hard disk bay, and then underneath here is probably our... Uh, main board, and I'd imagine uh, everything else, including uh, the LAN card. So let's just take a quick survey 
to see how difficult this could potentially be to remove and take a closer look. Alright, so now that we have those screws loosened up, we will need to detach our green antenna wire because that is rooted uh, through here. Okay, that kind of hinges out of the way. So we've got this piece of foam literally just hanging out in there, doing nothing, just covering some stuff. And it would give us access to our Wi-Fi card, which is very immensely taped, so I'm leaving that alone. We also have access to this chip down here, which is a controller for whatever that thing on the bottom is. I want to say that it is a barcode reader, but I'm not 100% sure. I'll see if I can get a close-up of that in a little bit. It does look like we have one accessible RAM slot on this side of the board. And it would... I can confirm that there is another RAM slot underneath on the other side as well. So there are two RAM slots. One is slightly more accessible than the other. Um, lots of screws holding this thing together. No doubt about it. So that's more or less what we're looking at. Everything else is going to be on the other side of this board that's held in with a lot of screws and tape. And that's about as far as I wanted to go with this one. So let's go ahead and reassemble it and see what we can get to work. All right, so as you can see, the, the batteries in this are kind of worn. Uh, so I've got it on the charger right now. If we press and hold our power button, we do get our Panasonic logo. And if you wanted to get into the BIOS, you need to be able to use the touch screen or have a keyboard attached. The question, of course, that we all need to ask ourselves today is, um, is the touch screen cooperating? because that's the issue that I had the last time I booted it into uh, Windows. The other thing is, if it's not working, will I be able to hook up my wireless keyboard and mouse and have it, again, uh, cooperate enough to kind of show you around the device? I did try, that's the operative word, to install some of the drivers to get uh, some of the hardware to work. However, it has been uh, less than cooperative. So we can see down here in the corner, and I'll try to get a zoom in on this, the touch screen having a jolly good freak out. There we go. So this is the area here in question that it will uh, repeatedly alternate between uh, two points, and it desperately wants to engage. Uh, that touch screen. So even when a mouse is connected, it'll often uh, relocate itself to this area. And unfortunately, I can't disable the touch screen and just use the pen because it's not that kind of pen input from what I can tell. All right, so here are the specs for this particular unit. So we've got an i5-3427U, 1.8 gigahertz processor. We're rocking uh, 4 gigs of DDR3. Again, there is uh, the other side of that, so I'm assuming you could expand this up to 8. Um, our touch screen, as you can see, um, I want to say that it's working okay. But it leaves an awful lot uh, to be desired here. And, of course... Our pen support uh, does appear to be a little better, but oddly enough, as soon as we boot into Windows, we have an issue with it messing about over here. The, the touchscreen <laughs> calibra uh, calibration system here uh, in the BIOS doesn't seem to do anything. So we are in Windows at this point. It is very slow for an i5 with only 4 gigs of RAM. Um, one of the things that I do note is that occasionally my mouse cursor will pop back over here and right 
click on its own, which is irritating to say the least. If I move my cursor away using a mouse, because that's about the only reliable way that I can control this computer at the moment, uh, that seems to get it to behave. The front-facing camera is really nothing to write home about. You could capture uh, a very low-resolution picture. It's a 0.5 megapixel uh, document camera. There's really no uh, benefit to it beyond that. Now, if the touchscreen on this thing was actually cooperating, then I would probably be able to uh, say, hey, this isn't so bad. Uh, but the problem is, is that the touchscreen is not cooperating. So if we use screen sketch, and we wanted to use the pen, this is wonderful. Uh, there isn't, there's a little bit of pressure sensitivity. It's not amazing. Again, no eraser like uh, many others that we've seen. So you gotta use the erase tool by hand. So in terms of that, the, the pen actually works pretty good. And if I could, I would just literally disable the touchscreen and, and use the pen with this specific model because the actual touch input from the finger seems to be um, very inconsistent, almost to the point of broken. I have to press this uh, immensely hard and it would not appear that all presses are being uh, appropriately recognized by the software and here's what I mean is if I wanted to press the start menu you can see that it's registering actually uh, up and to the right and then when it's uh, really misbehaving you can see in this corner this is where the input likes to jump back down to so this unreliable the pen uh, considerably more reliable it uh, isn't perfectly calibrated either, as you can kind of see, but it's certainly better. So I guess it's conclusion time here with this particular device. And how do I feel about it? Well, it's certainly better built than the last tough book that I took a look at. This is actually rugged and not made out of what feels like cheap plastic. That being said, uh, I would definitely want to take the Explorer uh, F5, whatever, that I looked at before. Uh, it's, it's thinner, but it doesn't feel any less rugged. It has pretty much the same port selection. It, the buttons here are more useful. Um, the dual battery system, I don't know if having two equal chunks of battery is as valuable as just hot swapping the one. I guess, depending on your situation, there's two different ways to solve that problem. The digitizer and the touchscreen on this, I think they got a real rough ride. I don't really believe that this is super indicative of the best quality that's out there, but that touchscreen, at least for the finger, has not held up well as the digitizer in the pen. The batteries in these, again, are probably all right. It seems like they have temperature sensors in them according to the BIOS. So yeah, I think that there's actually a lot more to like with this one than there is the other Panasonic, but if you were to ask me to choose between this and the Explore Motion, I would probably uh, seek out the Motion. Um, I don't know. Let me know what you think down in the comments below. If I get any more of these uh, handle tablets, I'll definitely uh, feature them on the channel. I'd be really curious to know what you think. Which one would you prefer, the Explore or this one? And I think that I will see you next time. And I'm really glad that that thing is no longer attached to my hand.